over in Canada right now. So uh, we're getting ready to go over there. Uh, his brother and his wife's here today. So let's give them a round of applause. Good to have you here. And we're looking forward to that. Uh, pray for the guys as they head out tomorrow morning around 7 o'clock, taking a, a bus up there. And so uh, we're excited about that opportunity. All right, well, tonight, let me get myself situated here. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Ephesians, continuing on that. This is part eight, uh, taking God to work. And this is uh, a, a good message. How many here are working outside the home? Let's see your hands. Good, good. How many of you have bosses? Great. Well, then you'll be able to apply this, uh, this lesson uh, to your life, because uh, I, I sure can do that as well. But it, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, as we're going to read that uh, tonight. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each of you for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Let's pray. Lord, we just pray for a blessing upon the reading of your word tonight. May this message fall on, on good soil tonight. And may it produce a harvest in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. All right. Have you ever taken your kids to work? That's always an adventure, isn't it, when you take your kids to work? Uh, well, we're talking about taking God to work. I mean, sometimes you have some great conversations, and you're on your way to work, and, and you talk with the Lord, and you just feel really good, and, you, and you, uh, you, you get ready to step out of the car, and he's getting ready to step out, and you say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, you just stay there. I'll come back. I'll come back in about nine hours, and we can talk some more. No, I mean, it's a part of who we are. We, we don't think about doing that because what? God lives inside of us, right? He lives inside of me, so I'm taking God with me into my workplace, but we have this compartmentalized life. We have our home life. We have our hobby life. We have our church life. We have our work life. And so as men, specifically as men, we compartmentalize stuff. Uh, sometimes I have, to take, uh, I have to take a piece of paper or I have to take something with me to remind me that there's something I'm supposed to do when I get home. Because sometimes it's not until I walk through the doors of my house, I say, oh, yeah, I was going to take care of that. And so as men, we compartmentalize this, which keeps our sanity a lot better. Uh, some of you women, uh, you got left brain, right brain, all just kind of joined together, and it just all meshes, and, and it just gets overwhelming at times. But I do know that you can compartmentalize as well. So I'm, I'm not talking about uh, being witnesses and doing our devotions and uh, t Bible study while we're on the job. No, absolutely not. If, if, you're, if you're there to work, then you need to work. That's what you're getting paid for. But we don't need to leave God out of it because he's become a part of who we are. Uh, but don't abuse what God has blessed you with and don't disguise it. So the number one indicator to a long life is work satisfaction. How many of you feel like you're dying? One study found out that the top in this research, they found out that people who really enjoyed their work, who was thrilled and ecstatic about their workplace, uh, were in the top of their field. They really enjoyed it. Now, you might say, well, how can I soar like an eagle when I work with a bunch of turkeys? I mean, that's a, that's a good question, but you don't understand who I work with. You don't understand the pornographic message, uh, 
images I see when I walk through. You don't understand all those people I see on Facebook in the middle of the day. You don't understand how mean they are. I have to work with them, the gossip, the backbiting that goes on. Well, that's true. I mean, it's not about having the right job. It's about you being the right person. That's what it's really all about. In all my years of employment, I've never worked for the, the perfect boss, the perfect job, in the perfect place, and had the perfect pay. So it's, it's a challenge to us. Can we be the people of God in the community to impact the community? That's our challenge. That's our, our mission statement here at uh, Firm Foundations. So secondly, sinners, oops, sinners are often known for working harder than many Christians. A number of years ago, a successful Christian businessman from Dallas in a large corporation there had this statement. He said, I'll hire any sinner any day before I hire a Christian. Now, why would he say such a thing? He said, sinners outwork Christians five to one. And he said, especially the spirit-filled believers. They're the worst, he said. Why is this? He said, because they pull, uh, we're brothers, you know, and it's okay. And they want to have their Bible study, and they want to witness when they're on the clock, and, and they're not diligent, and they're not faithful, and they expect all the favorites because we're family. Well, what kind of a life is that for us? We're the body of Christ, uh, and, and that is... Even a Christian businessman and women would rather hire sinners than Christians. There's something wrong with that picture. And so uh, when you have somebody that's, that's diligent, Christians ought to be the, the best workers, shouldn't they? They should be the best. It's not always true that, that it was his experience. It's not always true, but we do keep hearing that kind of a thread from time to time. I spoke to a, a Christian man just this last week. He, he confronted me and was complaining about all sorts of stuff that he was having happen, and, and uh, engineering was the issue. We just can't get it right. And some of that could be true, but his, the way he expressed it was, was quite odd. Uh, and then I talked to his boss about the situation, and his comment was this. He has a tendency to complain about almost anything that doesn't fit into or make his world run easier. And I confronted him at the time. I says, is... You're a Christian. Why are you acting like this? I mean, there's a way to confront somebody. There's a way to deal with, address a situation. I, in some cases, I've been treated better by heathens than I have about people who, who are brothers in the Lord. And that's just wrong. That's just wrong. So the greatest witness we can, can be is, is letting our light shine and, and not preaching uh, Jesus and thumping our Bible at work, but being the absolute most amazing employees that the business has ever seen. We need to let our light shine. We need to live a life of integrity. And we need to be fair with people, not taking advantage of, of people. Let's let our light shine. First Timothy 6, 2 says, Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect, because they are brothers, instead they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. So the third shocking truth is 65% of American workers are unhappy with their jobs. Does that mean that 65% of the, of the workplaces are horrible places to work? And that there's only 35% that are good places to work? No, I don't think that's what they're saying. I believe it comes back to attitude again. It's about the attitude. It comes back to how we approach our job. Uh, do we look at it as just a paycheck and we're just doing the bare minimum to get our paycheck? Or do we look at it as a calling, as a place that we've been called to to make an impact? That's a little bit different. So we have to have a different mindset every day when we go into our workplace. And we need to work. It's good to work. It's not a curse. It can be difficult at times. But God has called us to work. And, and we can find blessings when we work. 
you know, we're with these, these workers probably more than in a, in a working day during daylight hours than we are with our own family. Why not make an impact that would be a pleasant place to work? Now, some people just like to be difficult. And I've, I've run across a few people like that. They're just jokers, and they just like to, to ter- create turmoil. And I, I don't really enjoy working around those, but they do keep it lively. There's never a dull moment. But, again, if we're called to work, there's a time to work, and there's a time during breaks and other uh, lunches and activities that you can do that other stuff. So, today I want to shake it up, and I want to give you some insight before you go and quit your job to find another one. I want to, to give you some insight into God's Word. And uh, shocking truth number four is most people don't leave a job, they leave a boss. How many of you are managers? Okay, we got a few. I include myself in that. So I have to ask you, how many people are underneath you? Larry, well, you got 250. <laughs> you got a lot of people underneath him. And so you have people that respond to you. They, they, they look to you for leadership and and you can uh, determine whether a person stays or goes just by the way you live. As, as a manager, as me being a manager, I can make it very difficult on a person uh, to the point where maybe they want to leave, find a different job. And I've, had a, I've had a few people leave, and I've, I've tried to say that it wasn't me, uh, that it was just a better, better paying job. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And so as a manager, the way we treat our staff and treat other people around you is going to determine the longevity of, of uh, how they live and work in that place. It could make a very big difference. You could be a great manager and people want to stay in your department forever. Um, so there's, a, there's an aspect to it that we need to consider. Now, I want to take Ephesians chapter 6, uh, and I want to, to switch it up just a little bit. If instead of slaves, we put the word employees... And instead of masters, we put the word bosses. We'll bring it to light today so that we can uh, understand that a little bit more. So I feel like some of you uh, feel like a slave, but you're an employee, and uh, you know how to work. And, and so some of you are bosses, and, and uh, you know you get the whip out, and you want to whip your, your, your employees into shape. And I'll do that from time to time, you know, just trying to, trying to get some action out of them. We've got to change the way we do business. But we can, we can use the words employees and, and, and bosses in these situations. And, and, uh, and so I will, I will do that here in a few minutes. So keeping in mind Ephesians, I want to jump back and, and with me into Genesis chapter 24 and show you Ephesians chapter 6 that's lived out in that. We're not going to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 right yet. But uh, Genesis chapter 24, let me give you a little background. It's about uh, Rebecca. And this is the story of uh, Isaac and Rebecca. And it's a great story. Abraham was, uh, was getting old. Sarah, was, his wife, was gone. And, and Isaac was the, the only last kid. I mean, he was, he was really in need of, uh, of, a, of a wife. He was 40 years old at the time. It was time for him to have his own wife. And so Abraham said he, he, was, uh, he wanted to choose a wife that was from his, his land. He didn't want to choose a, a wife from around the area where he was living. And so Abraham says to a servant, I want you to go pick out uh, a wife for Isaac. Now, people kind of associate uh, ugliness with godliness. So if I'm Isaac, you know, I'm thinking, here's this old servant. He's old and wrinkled. What kind of a wife is he going to pick out for me? You know, uh, I, I want a Bahama mama. I don't, I don't want some old lady that's all wrinkled that's going to be attracted to this old servant. You know, so I might get a little upset. I might, might get a little nervous and say, why are you sending him? Come on, Dan. What are you, what are you talking about here? I mean, uh, 
I mean, he might be wigging out, all nervous. How's this thing going to turn out? I can just see him. You know, he's in, in verses uh, 24, or, or chapter 24, verses 10 through 14. If you, if you look at that, I'll read that there. It says, um, then the servant left, taking with him ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram and made his way to the town an hour. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was towards evening, and the time the women go out to draw water. And then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown kindness to your master. So let's talk about what it looks like to take God to work. I'm going to tie the two together with Rebecca and the old servant and Ephesians chapter 6. So in, in Ephesians 6, 5, it says, Employees, obey your earthly bosses with respect and fear. And the fear that we're talking about is a Greek word, which means maximum exertion or effort. So you're to treat them with respect and maximum exertion or effort. So as we talk about work ethics, and, and honestly, I get a lot of young people that come in, and, uh, in from engineering field, and they start with my department. We get to train them. And there's one thing that's hard to train, and that is work ethics. You know, they, it, you can teach them how to to do design, you can teach them how to draw, you can teach them a lot of things, but you, it's hard to teach a person that you shouldn't be on a computer surfing the internet when you're on working hours. Um, if you, you, there's a lot of things, I mean, you can teach them and you can bring punishment to them and expose it, and that has a way of molding that, but there's certain work ethics that uh, you just kind of have or you don't. And uh, some people that don't have it have a hard time changing, and they find themselves uh, out the door. But uh, work ethics, we serve with respect and maximum exertion. So when the, the man asked Rebecca for a drink of water, uh, Rebecca did what hopefully any good citizen would do, or what any good employee would do. Someone is asking for a need to be fulfilled, and, and uh, she said, yes, I can do that. But Rebecca did something more. She said, I am going above and beyond. She's going to go above and beyond the call of duty. And so that's, do we do just the bare minimum, or do we go above and beyond? Here at Firm Foundation, we've seen people go above and beyond. The test loss, putting this together and that out there, that is a, a remarkable task. That's above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, I have seen uh, people in our youth group, you know, going above and beyond and serving. I've, I've seen people in our VBS, uh, Julie Berger, uh, painting her face up to look like animals during VBS. I sh she went above and beyond. And so there's a, there's a lot of ways that we can go above and beyond. Uh, Don said uh, to me that uh, last Sunday, he was out here and around, and, and one of our members, as they were getting the kids checked in, uh, was out front, and they had a new person that was coming to get their kids checked in. And she, uh, she said, let me show you where this preschool nursery is. And so she took her uh, over and, and, and made sure that they knew where they were going. She could have said, well, just follow signs. Don't be a dummy. They're right over there. You know? and, but no, she, she made sure that, that they understood where they were going. So Rebecca said, I'm not just going to give you a drink of water. I'm going to feed your camels as well. 
How many camels did they, they have on the trip? You remember? Ten. Can everybody say ten? Ten. ten. That's what Don would say. Ten. Now, a thirsty camel can drink 20 to 30 gallons of water. And so you got 10 camels. You could have up to 300 gallons of water if they were completely dry and just wanted to drink. This wasn't just a short little, little uh, filling station here for her. It wasn't just one time she went and put water in the trough. No, she had to go back. It could have lasted two hours. It could have taken two hours of work to fill up all these camels. And it says until they were done drinking. I mean, they were just lapping it up, lapping it up, lapping it up. And she just kept going back and forth, back and forth. Why did she do that? Because she's serving with respect to this individual that had a need. And she's serving with maximum exertion. It wasn't a half-baked job. It wasn't doing just what was required to do. It wasn't the bare minimum. Well, this isn't in my job description, so I'm not going to do it. Somebody else will do it. It's not my job. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not doing this. There's lots of things that we do or don't do, and we have to check our attitude. Are we there to serve? in any fashion, any way. I had a long meeting this afternoon, two-hour meeting with the president of the company and doing some, some, giving some information. It was above and beyond my job. It was something I was doing uh, for my boss and, and because I was willing to help the company. And so it, it does happen. But I've had other people who basically say, that's not my problem. Uh, that's a sales issue. And, and they're satisfied with just letting it go because they don't want to get involved. They don't want to risk too much. You know, there's a lot of people that want to complain and find problems in life. But I like talking to the ones that want to be a part of the solution. They, maybe they complain in leadership. You have to, find, you have to talk about problems. But you, if you can find a, uh, have a problem and you can find a solution for it, now, that, now you're being a part of the problem rather than just complaining. And there's plenty, you can find them all over the place that likes to complain. They don't risk much. They don't mind if you risk your neck. They don't mind if you put yourself out there, uh, but they're, they're way behind you. I mean, way behind you. So today's philosophy, I'll do the least expected of me and try to get the most payment. That's just sad, but that's, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, this goes on in verse 5. It says, if, it says, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ, obey them not only to win the favor when their eyes is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. So our, our goals should be not just to serve God, uh, our boss when they're looking, uh, but to serve them as if you're serving the Lord. To work as if you're serving the Lord. To, to be able to look at God and as, as always seeing. And uh, I've, had, I've had people work for me that as soon as I left the area, they just started messing around and didn't get done what I needed to get done. And, uh, you know, if you're not there, if, if the boss is away, the people play. But, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be for Christians. We should live to a higher standard. And I think that's what this is really saying to us. So when we take God to work, we serve everyone as if we would Jesus. That's, that's our goal. That's what we need to be doing. Well, you know, if you knew who I worked with and how challenging they are, you wouldn't be saying that. You, you just don't know. You don't know what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm dealing with here. You know, why did God say to pray for those who persecute you? Why did he say to... To bless those who, are, who do wrong to you. You know, we're to be a witness, and sometimes it's just hard to do. I had one guy that just was just hammering me, and I had to try to be a blessing to him and, uh, years ago. And, and it was probably uh, two, three years of dealing with that on a regular basis. And, and he ended up was going to take another job, and he came up to me before he left. And he shook my hand, and he says, 
I haven't been fair to, to you. You're a good man. And he left. And I thought, that was a challenge. It was a challenge to do the right thing in, in the face of adversity, to try to leave a witness. So you might say, I love my job, I love what I do, but I can't stand him or her. <laughs> and that's, that's a lot of, that happens. You run into people that are like that, and it's really a challenge. Uh, but if God is the God of love, the God of all peace, and a God of all joy, and he lives inside of us, don't you think he, would, he could empower you to be contagious and fulfill that place with love, just bubble over. I mean, you come here, right? You come to this place where God's presence is all over. There's nothing more embarrassing than to hear somebody say, they go to your church? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to apply yourself. you got to be filled, and you got to be... Uh, it's not just a meeting place. But it's, it's a place where you can get empowered and be encouraged. And you can walk into this place, an unbeliever, and you can walk out of this place, an unbeliever. The choice is yours. I, I hope you choose life. That's what I hope. So what are you doing? You're, you're allowing that person to set the atmosphere for your attitude. And we've said it before, if somebody, you know, turns you off and gets you all upset, gets you worked out of joint, and, and you know, basically beats you up, why should you let that person uh, cause you to, to be uh, angry and, and, unre- and resentful and bitter and, and, and live in turmoil instead of peace? Just forgive them and move forward. Doesn't mean you have to go on a vacation with them, but you you do have to try to trust God. And you know what? Uh, Joseph went through some hard times. Joseph went through the, he went to the pit. You know, he was it was the pits for him, and he got thrown in the pit by his own brothers. And they wanted to kill him, and it wasn't easy for him. And then he went to he got sold into slavery. He went to Potiphar's place, and 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 he was he was a slave. So he went from the pit to being slave. And then he got thrown into the prison, and he was in prison for a while. Why? What is going on? I mean, he wasn't having a good time. It was not a good day for Joseph. But you know, everywhere he went, it says that Potiphar's house was blessed. It says the prison was blessed. He took care of everything. Finally, he got the opportunity to move from the prison to the palace in a single day and was put second in command. All that work was preparation. Those people who are dis, you know, difficult to you might just be preparing you for, for your next promotion. You just don't know. God has a, a weird sense of humor. Jesus said, out of your belly flows rivers of living water. And so that's, that's what we need to be. We need to be a people where blessings flow out of us. We want to do it because we're full of joy and full of life, full of abundant living. So Rebecca had no idea who this man was. Here's this old wrinkly, crinkly, dusty camel smelling really bad, uh, and the, the, men, the man smelling really bad. And he didn't pull in his hot chariot with chrome wheels or anything like that. He was just a traveler. Apparently a wealthy traveler because he had lots of gifts loaded up on these ten camels. But she served him because it was a part of her character. It was a part of who she was. It was a part of her nature. Total stranger spending that much time describes who Rebecca was. Nancy can be that way. She can, she can go and serve people. Because it's just a part of who she is. She enjoys it. brings pleasure to her. There's things that we do that when we're flowing in the anointing of what God has designed us to do, we find pleasure in it. It gives us energy. And usually you know when you're 
flowing in not your gift that uh, drains you to the point where you want to take a nap. I mean, it just wears you right out. So I'm sure the ladies were probably thinking, oh, man, there's this guy is coming with 10 camels. He's probably going to want some water. Let's just hold back. Wait, there's Rebecca. Yeah, she'll do it. She'll go up there. She'll do it. Let's hold back. And so they probably did. You ever had people like that? Uh, you know, the people that are, uh, they say, oh, um, let, let's, not, let's not do that. Let's not volunteer for that. You know, Corey will do it. Let's, Corey, she'll, she'll step up. She'll do it. Let's just kind of hold back. And, and uh, every time there's a thing that comes up, we'll let Corey do it. Well, then they get all upset when Corey gets raises and Corey gets promotions and Corey gets the bonuses. But she's the one volunteering. She's the one stepping forward. And, and uh, that's, that's kind of what happens when you, when you promote, when you move that way, when you have the right attitude. It's not an attitude. It's not like she was saying, boy, if I do this, I think I'll get a raise. No, there's certain people that would do it because it's above and beyond the call of duty. It's, it's something that you just have inside you. It's the character of God that causes you to step forward. And, and that's, that's what Rebecca did. So you're serving people like you would serve Jesus. That's what we got it called to do. You're not in it for man's reward. You're, you're not doing it for recognition from your boss. You're doing it for the most high to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But why is it that people can separate that and say, well, this is work, so I act this way at work. But when I go to church, I'll act this way. When I'm, when I'm uh, on Monday out with the boys, I'll act this way. You know, that, that's not right. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, God lives inside of you and he transforms you to be the same person everywhere you go. Use your gifts at church. Use them at the workplace on not the appropriate time. But, you know, you can use that. You can pray for your company. And you can ask God if he has a word for you. And you can go down and give that word to your, comp- your boss. Hey, I just feel like there's something in Australia as far as sales. I just had this dream the other night. And I just seen this happening. I've done that. I, we just had a guy that was uh, in Australia, matter of fact, uh, just got back and says there's a little bit of work over that way. So verse 6 says, Obey them, this is Ephesians, Obey them not only to win the favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, a servant, doing the will of God from your heart. It's a part of our nature. And if you're taking notes... Don't wait for the big moments, but make every moment count. Sometimes it's the little things that can make the biggest difference. The little things at the right time can make a huge difference in your future. Uh, She wasn't waiting for Prince Charming to show up. Everybody's waiting for Prince Charming to show up, but she wasn't. She moved. Uh, An old, ugly, calloused man showed up. He was really a frog and was going to turn out to be a prince in the prince's name. And his name was Isaac. And he was going to be uh, one of the wealthiest human beings on the face of the planet because his father was going to give him everything he had. She didn't know that. You know, had she known that, I'm sure all the other ladies would have been pushing themselves to the front. If you really want to succeed, write this down, form the habit of doing things that people who are failures don't like to do. Do the things that other people don't like to do. You know, say stuff like, hey, I'll, do, I'll get that. I'll do that. I'll cover that. You can take that with me. I got it. I got it. <laughs> you should actually get in fights with other employees to try to fight for the things that other people don't want to do. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but be it. Be a good employee. Verse 7 says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. So the word wholeheartedly translated means loyal enthusiasm. We need to serve with loyal enthusiasm. A year ago, I, I created this document and stuck it on my wall. And all it was was, Uh, a bunch of definitions. I wanted to be reminded of them. I was working at trying to improve some things. Half-hearted is on the top. Having or showing little enthusiasm and a half-hearted attempt at work. 
wholehearted, right underneath that. Timid, bold, confident. Those are other words. I wanted to be reminded. I wanted to be a wholehearted, bold, confident employee. And so for a year, I had that on my wall to remind myself of that. And I thought it was really funny that uh, this is a part of the message today. But number one, loyalty is missing, a missing trait in the workplace today, it seems like. Um, you know, I got 25 cents more if I go over there, so I'm taking off, and I'm going to go over this place for more money. Where's the loyalty? Where's, it's, it's not always about the money, you know. Oh, you did me wrong, so I'm out of here. Um, you know, you can experience that at church, too. You know, where's the loyalty at church? You had somebody you invested a lot of time into, and then, and then you forgot to go to your, your uncle's uh, cousin's uh, funeral, and so, because you didn't do that, they're out of here. Um, I mean, we're not going to, we're, we're leaders, we're not, we're not uh, gods. Uh, there's going to be times that it's, it, that's going to get missed, and uh, we hope that you understand. And uh, when those things happen, anybody have been offended lately? Yeah, it's easy to get offended in, in life, anywhere you go, uh, especially in Washington. Just got to make sure, you know, the right people get elected. Uh, but you know what? Uh, if we get offended, we need to get over it. We need to get over it. We got more important things to worry about that God has for you to do. Uh, you know, I'm going to quit because they, they didn't treat me right. Well, you know, big baby, grow up. I mean, you're thin that skin, that, that, your skin that thin. I mean, we, we, need, to, we need to be adults here. And we need to, to act like Christians. And you need to be the light of the place. There was a time when things were really ugly at my workplace and years ago. And, and people were just leaving left and right. And it's like you can see the potential. It's a great place to work. There's a lot of potential there. And, and uh, you know, it, people would say, well, why don't you go leave? Why don't you go someplace else? And I think, because God's called me here. I, I, I don't feel like I'm supposed to leave. I feel like I'm supposed to stay and make a difference. I'm supposed to provide hope for those that are going through difficult times. And things have really been turning around, and it's a great place to work, and we're excited to see what is taking place at Baroque Tool. So we need to go above and beyond our job that's at hand. You got a job description? I didn't even have a job description for a long time, so I just did what I thought was the right thing to do. Now I have a job description, and I try to go above and beyond that. Sometimes it gets me in trouble, but uh, sometimes it, it really makes a difference. And I think that's the important thing is doing what the right thing is for the sake of the company to be a blessing, right? So we should go above and beyond what we're asked to do. That's, that's something important. If we want to take God with us into our workplace, we need to be that kind of a people. Don't do just what's asked and then sit back and, and say you had the answer, but nobody... Nobody uh, asks you. I mean, offer yourself. Take a chance of being rejected. Give it, work through the proper authorities. Here's another tidbit. Act like an owner versus a renter. Most people approach their workplace saying, oh, it's his company. I'm, I'm just a renter. You ever rented a car? In those cars, they, the speed bumps come and People don't even slow down for them, do they? But if it was your car, well, you're going to slow down a little bit more and take it a little bit easier. Well, we need to, we need to make sure that uh, we treat our job as if we're an owner. Hey, stop and pick up that piece of paper. Why, why, why wait for the janitor to do it? Take pride in what you do. Something's out of order, take time because that's your job. That, this is your company. You want to make this thing great. So you're working to turn this place around. Take pride in this place. Do set the example for others to follow. Why not? If you want it to be a great place, if you want the place to prosper, if you personally want to grow in your in your income, maybe you need to make the place grow in their profit margin. So make a difference. Make a difference overall. Set an example for others to follow. That can happen here at church too. Don't treat it like this is Don's church. Or it's that church I go to. No, it's, it's my church. 
Come on, everybody say, my church. My church. Yeah, it's your church. It's my church. We need to take pride in this. You see something out of order? You see the bathroom in there is plugged up? Do something about it. Tell people, come to my church. Don't come to that church there in Central. Take ownership of it. Amen? Amen. So many people want to do a great job somewhere, just not here. What are you waiting for? Make a difference where you are placed. That's the example that Joseph did. Joseph made a difference no matter where he was. You think it was easy being in jail? No, it wasn't easy, but he made a difference. He made a huge difference. And this, don't despise the little jobs. You see, it was just a little job of watering camels that opened up the door for Rebecca. It was just a little job of giving an old man a drink. And it didn't seem like it would get very far, but it didn't seem like it would bring the, the big break he was looking for. But it's the people who do the little jobs that make a big difference. And, uh, you know, somebody's got to do it. And, and one, one day I realized I was somebody. And that needs to be uh, for all of us. David, he, he, he was a pooper scooper. He was out there taking care of sheep. He wasn't in the kingdom. He wasn't a, a big king or king material. Nobody walked up to him and said, hey, look at David. He's king's material. No, he was out there taking care of the sheep. He was a pooper scooper. On, he was probably the best pooper scooper on the planet. But he was taking care of sheep. Now, I'm serious. For, for God to anoint somebody like that through Samuel anointing him, it was just God. It was, it was a God moment for him to see it. It wasn't that he was out, you know, uh, working in the palace. He was out on the hill. He was taking care of sheep. And God recognized that. And God will recognize each of you when you do the right things. Maybe the blessing that is, is meant to come your way is being, be, being held back because of your attitude. Maybe you've had the wrong attitude and God has been waiting to give you a blessing that you've been longing for just because you've had the wrong attitude instead of serving your boss, instead of serving your company and having the right attitude, you've been grumbling and complaining. Look what happened in the Old Testament when people grumbled and complained, uh, murmured. Man, the whole ground opened up and swallowed them. That was, that was not a pleasant experience. As the people of God, we need to have a peace inside of us and flow inside of us outward. And we need to be uh, people that sets the example. No, God saw something in David as a shepherd boy, and he says, I can use him. And if he is faithful in little, what's the Bible say that will happen? If you're faithful in little, then you will be put over much. I had a guy that uh, worked for me. He was 10, ten years older than, than I was at the time several years ago. And uh, he came in to do engineering, but he wasn't an engineer. I found that out. He had sold me a bill of goods, and so that was part of the reason I hired him, but I didn't know, I couldn't discern that he was uh, BSing me. But he ended up uh, wanting to do all these fantastic designs. Oh, I just want to do these big things. And I would give him small tasks, just a small project, and he couldn't get that right. And so I said to him, I can't give you this little thing. I'm not going to give you those big things. There's a, lot more, there's a lot more that's riding on that big thing. A lot more responsibility, a lot more accountability coming back on me if you don't get your job right. And so he didn't do it. Eventually, he got fired. And then I found out that he went into the last place with the Colt 44 after he got fired. I wish I would have known that before. But I protected that, and that didn't happen. You know, an interesting thing about that is, just a side note, he asked me if he could put my name down as a reference. So I, I had some calls when they asked for a reference for a job. What do you know about this person? I said, well, is he going to work with people? No, we're just going to put him over on a computer. I said, then he'll do just fine. So 
So you want a big salary, you want the big job, you want a big office in the corner, start by doing the little things. Verse 8 in Ephesians says, Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are an employee or a boss. That's why we do it. I also feel that if you're a boss who misuses your position of authority, that God will remove it from you. He puts kings in, he establishes kings, and he takes them out. Romans says that he establishes authorities. And so he can clearly establish, he can put them in, and he can remove them. We've, I've prayed over some situations, and, uh, and people have been removed. If they don't use their authority properly, then God will give it to someone else. So we serve based upon God's pay scale. Never take a job based on a salary. Um, I knew too many people have changed jobs. Oh, I love this job, I love this job, and I can make so much more over there. I had one guy that uh, had recommitted his life to the Lord, and he was coming up on breaks, and he had a lot of Christian friends around him at, at the workplace where he was at. And then it was within three weeks. Within about three weeks, he said, hey, I got this job offer. I think I can take over in another place. I said, hey, I'm really concerned about that. You really need to grow. You need, to, you need to, this encouragement. You need to have security here. Oh, but I can make more money over there. I said, I don't know. I don't feel real good about that. And anyway, he took the job, and he got put on nights. And the next thing you know, he was completely taken out of church, completely stopped going to church. Uh, basically, he disappeared out of society for years. And so sometimes all that glitters isn't gold. Sometimes they say grass is greener on the other side, but that's because it's grass is over the septic tank. You've got to remember that. So you work for God. God is your source. Help people and you will always be a blessing. And you will always be blessed. Three key words that make up a big difference with big results is, and then some. Do your job, and then some. Rebecca, she did her job. She did what was asked, give me some water, and then some. She did more, didn't she? She went above and beyond of what was asked of her. Give a little bit. What if we, in, what if we did that in our marriages? Oh, come on. What if, we, what if we did more than just what was expected of us or what was asked of us? What if we actually engaged in a relationship with our wife? What if we went above and beyond and served her? What if we had a challenge to outserve one another? Guys, what if you actually went shopping with her? What if you, what if you didn't, what if you was able to keep up with her while you were shopping? What if you actually engage in, and, and ladies, what if you said to your husband, I'm looking for a white blouse a size small with little uh, things hanging down. That's what I'm looking for. Now we can actually engage because now we can hunt for it. We can hunt that thing down like a dog. We can sniff it out and we can help you find the deal. What, do you, what, what are you looking for? Engage. What if we really went above and beyond in our marriages what if we shut the TV off and we had a conversation? Now, there's a lot of things that we could apply here. If we went above and beyond, yeah, what about phones? Those things are nasty. You got to look and check your messages. All right, extra blessing comes from extra effort. In uh, Colossians 3, 22 through 25, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is upon you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence, reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it as if with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So let's look what happens in Genesis 24 through 22, or 24, 22. It says, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. So 
good things came to Rebecca for her efforts. Those ten camels were loaded down with all sorts of gifts, and I believe they went right to Rebecca, and we can see in God's word that it, it also went to her brother and her mother. In verse 34, it says, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle and silver and gold, male and female um, servants, camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. Wow. Her family gets blessed because of a small thing that she did. You want to be a blessing to the second generation of your children's children? Then you need to be faithful. You need to be a God-taking person to work, and you become the employee that this planet uh, has never seen or heard of. Amen? Be a blessing. And lastly, she becomes in the line and the lineage and becomes the great, 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 grandmother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So because of her faithfulness, because of a little act of kindness, God has allowed that to, to, to be very honored, to be one that is very honored. It is, if you read the story, she goes with him that day. He wanted to wait a week. Just wait a week so we can say goodbye. She agrees to go that day, if not the next day, probably the next day. But they go that day, and she sees Isaac in the distance, gets off, puts her veil on, and goes up to him and agrees to be his wife. What an act of faithfulness and servanthood. And Isaac was a good-looking man, so she was probably... Very really thankful, too, and, and Rebecca was a good-looking lady. And the Lord blessed them for their efforts. Will you stand with me? It says, the Lord blessed the Egyptian house for Joseph's sake. See, Joseph was the prisoner, and from a prisoner to second command in Egypt because of his faithfulness and taking care of details. And God blessed him. He had to get the prophecy and interpretation of dreams, and he used those in the places, and when he got out, he had the gift of leadership and plans, and God used him. The Lord blessed Egypt, and the, the Lord blessed Sarah through Isaac, because Joseph was the son of uh, Jacob, who was, uh, Isaac would have been Jacob's dad. So Joseph would have been a grandson to Isaac, and so they they preserved the lineage of Jesus. I was talking this just today with Ronnie. We had lunch. And God had preserved that whole area that was a famine in the land. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And because of Joseph coming through that ranks, he put a plan in place to save a fifth of the crops. Had he not done that, people in that area would have starved. And Jesus would have been in jeopardy. But God preserved. He had a plan. And we know that uh, you are men and women and sons and daughters and of the Most High God. And God will bless the business and the corporation where you work at because you're there. I always think when I get on a plane and get ready to dry, uh, fly someplace, you know, all these people are going to have a blessing of a trip because God's not done with me yet. I say, it's not my time to go. And then this, this crazy thought comes across, what if it's the pilot's time to go? <laughs> because he knows that the number one avenue, and he's not going to just drop gold nuggets from heaven, the number one way he's going to meet and provide your need is through your job, and that's coming to you. So he's going to bless the business because you're in it. You're there. Does everyone believe that? Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let's pray. God, I pray for every person here. I pray, God, that the, they would be a laborer, that they would be a servant, and they would be a worker. Uh, they'd be the employee that you would, and they would be the boss that you called them to be. 
the business owner, the manager, the, the supervisor that you've called them to be, Lord. God, help every one of us to give all, all that we have to serve in our workforce and the, the workplace as, as though we've served in every second of every minute of every hour or every day to worship in, in, in you, Lord. Lord, I just pray for supernatural favor as these people demonstrate your character. I pray that they'll be see the benefits and the blessings and the rewards and, and the bonuses and the raises and promotions, God, that you have waiting for them, that they show themselves faithful over little, and, God, that you'll put them over much. In Jesus' name, in God's people said, amen, amen. Go be a blessing. In the mezzanine for the... Uh, uh